Today's event is a really special event. Uh, it's one of our film comment live panels at the festival. Uh, if you don't know already, and I, I hope you do know, but if you don't, Film Comment is a publication of Film at Lincoln Center. It's been around since the 1960s. Uh, I edit it along with my co-editor, Clint Crout. Uh, We Right now we have a weekly newsletter uh, where we publish uh, original criticism, reviews, essays, interviews, and more uh, every Thursday. It's free to subscribe, so please sign up for it uh, at filmcomment.com. We also have a weekly podcast, also free, called the Film Comment Podcast, where we gather together filmmakers, critics, thinkers, uh, to talk about whatever's important in film culture right now. This conversation that I'm going to introduce in just a second will go on the podcast this week. So if you have friends who wanted to attend and could not attend, please let them know and sign up. Um, I'm really excited about uh, the panel today. We have some greats on this panel, as you guys know. Um, this, so the Film Comment Live talks are a, a subsection of the NYFF talks where we gather together filmmakers and critics and other thinkers to sort of connect the films in the program to broader issues in the film world and film culture. Uh, issues that we think uh, need a critical perspective. And today is a really special um, uh, example of an, uh, a Film Comment Live talk. So first of all, I'd like to say that today's talk is a collaboration with the journal World Records, which is edited by Jason Fox, who will be joining us on the panel. This came about because uh, World Records has uh, just launched an audio series called Trust Issues, which explores the idea of how nonfiction images build relationships with viewers and how they can bring us together and also alienate us from each other. And Jason and I did a panel at the Camden Film Festival recently with uh, the filmmaker Ramel Ross and Melissa Thando Bongela, digging into some, um, some of these issues. And so we're really excited to do sort of a sequel to that here. And the filmmakers we have on today's panel, titled Trust Issues, just like the World Records audio series, uh, are incredible practitioners of all kinds of cinematic techniques. Um, all three of them have dabbled with both fiction and nonfiction by this point in their careers. And they uh, use these techniques really intelligently to both invite us in and sometimes push us out so that we can think politically and critically about the images that we see on screen. So let me uh, introduce today's filmmakers. First of all, I'm going to bring on stage Rosine Bakum, the director of Mambar Pierret. Next, I'm going to invite Kleber Mendonça Filio, the director of Pictures of Ghosts. Please put your hands together for Frederick Wiseman, director of Menus Plagiarism Les Pragois. I did my best with that French title. I'm not going to say it again. <laughs> um, Please welcome Jason Fox, editor of World Records. And Clinton Crout, my co-editor at Film Common. Thank you all so much for joining us, uh, taking time out of your schedules to do this. Uh, we're very excited to bring you all together. They've all watched each other's movies. They've done a lot of homework, and we can't wait to see uh, what you have to say. But before we dig into some of these questions, I want to invite Jason to talk a little bit about uh, the audio series that he has produced and kind of the ideas behind it, which are the framework for today's discussion. Um, great. Thanks, Devika. Thanks, Clint, for organizing this. Thanks for everybody at Lincoln Center uh, who makes this festival and makes this event possible. And thanks for coming on a really sunny day um, in New York, where you could have been a lot of different places, but you chose to be here. Um, so thank you. Yeah. So. My name is Jason. I'm the editor of a journal called World Records. Um, we're sort of in the process this fall of rolling out a five uh, 
uh, episode audio series titled Trust Issues, as Devika mentioned. Just quickly say the, the first episode that we released a few weeks ago, um, broadly speaking, sort of del deals with um, the racialized boundaries between fiction and nonfiction. We often treat, especially in maybe festival contexts, um, these, um, these these labels as, as categories, discrete categories that maybe exist outside of, you know, uh, time, space, and politics. Um, but oftentimes, what gets to count as one or the other has a lot to do with um, uh, the color of the skin of people behind the cameras and in front of the cameras. Um, the second episode that we released just this a uh, few days ago was titled "My Truth, Your Truth, Our Truth," um, and broadly speaking. Um, um, and features um, the, the filmmaker, author, and activist Astra Taylor, the artist John Acumfra, and the filmmaker Charlie Shackleton. And broadly speaking, sort of thinking about the roles of images um, in building new forms of consensus and organizing, and how difficult it is to uh, let go of maybe old old forms of consensus and to build um, to build new ones. Um, so the sort of just before, I mean, just before we came out in our, in our very brief conversation about what we might talk about, I mean, really what we, um, uh, think what we agree, I don't know where this panel will go, but, but what we agreed on is that we wouldn't fall into what, you know, what I hope for, for, for all of us are tired conversations of, is this thing, is this thing documentary or is this thing fiction? Is this thing truthful or is this thing, you know, ostensibly a lie? Um, um, and uh, I agree that I would sort of just say a little bit about what for me the stakes of are of using a term like trust. Um, for me, you know, I'm somebody like I would in a in a venue like this and on a panel like this. Um, this is where actually I saw uh, neighboring sounds. I don't know, 11 years ago, 12 years ago, and one of these two cinemas, which was, um, you know, a really remarkable experience for me. I, in, a, in a context like this, I want to say I'm a cinephile, um, but I'm, I'm not really. Like, I like cinema. I watch a lot of cinema, but I don't identify as a cineph cinephile. I come to this work through, 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 you know, a background in in. in organizing, being a part of movement, wanting to be a part of movements um, and activism. And, and thus, I'm interested in sort of frameworks that give us as much agency as, as possible. Um, and, you know, so oftentimes, context, uh, in contexts in which we talk about documentary, we sort of, we come to speak about truth as, like, as an essence or as a category, as a thing that's out there that we're all beholden to, as opposed to, you know, the notion of trust, um, which opens opens up a much broader set of questions about the terms that we create for each other, like why we trust each other, why we don't trust each other, how we relate to each other in the room, why you would choose, I mean, maybe you didn't choose to listen to me or any of us, but right, why we can start thinking about how, you know, how we're all situated in this, in this room right now, how we come together, how we are alienated from each other, um, which is the spirit of the, of the, um, you know, of the, of the series more broadly. Um, maybe that's all, that's all that I'll, I'll say about it, you know, for now so that I can let other people, other people speak. Well, uh, kind of to immediately contradict what you just said. I think our first, <laughs> our first <Good> start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The best, the best way to start. Um, our first question really to start things off is, uh, for Fred and Rosine, um, why documentary or why nonfiction as a, as a means of communication for Rosine? I know your, your new film is not nonfiction, but previously you've worked in that mode. So maybe you could both talk a little bit about what about the nonfiction mode appeals to you in terms of communicating with an audience. And also what it means to you. I mean, what, what is nonfiction to you? Right. What does that involve? Um, <clears throat> Sorry for my English. <laughs> I, um, I, I discovered uh, nonfiction really lately. Um, my desire of cinema really um, began by fiction. I really watch uh, American films, French films, and it's how my desire of cinema uh, was built. 
and uh, I discovered nonfiction when I came in Belgium to study cinema because I was used to see reportage in, on the TV and for me it was not the cinema that I wanted to do. And uh, when I discovered nonfiction, I discovered also the history of nonfiction, how it's built some ideology like uh, colonialism and how it's also built an imaginary of Africa and African people. And, uh, and for me, it was a revelation that I have to start with nonfiction because it gave me the freedom to build my own gaze and my own relationship with people without having an intermediary. I can take a camera and really be in direct contact with people that I want to film. And, um, and because also I, I want that intimacy that nonfiction can, can give to a filmmaker. And, um, and because I, I was in need of deconstructing and finding my gaze because, like I said before, I came to cinema by, by seeing uh, American film and French film, but it was open me to the world, but not connected me to my, my culture, to my reality. I, how can I think and impact my reality if I'm, I'm not seeing it? And, uh, and nonfiction was really uh, an evidence for me because it was the tools that built the imaginary that I wanted to deconstruct. It was the tool that uh, some colonization used to build um, the, uh, the ideology to go in Africa and colonize people. And I, for me, it was a tool also of deconstruction, nonfiction. Yeah. Fred? Well, I mean, I, I sort of stumbled into what I do. Um, I, I, uh, I started a long time ago, and uh, uh, I didn't really think I had a choice. Uh, uh, I, I thought most of the fiction movies I, I saw were terrible. <laughs> uh, uh, and it, uh, you know, I, I had the obvious thought that um, everyday experience contained things that were funnier. Uh, uh, sadder, tr more tragic than uh, m m m most of what, at least what I had seen in, in traditional movies. Uh, and I started at a time when the, the technological development, namely you could shoot sync sound in 16 millimeter without a cable linking the camera and the tape recorder. That had been, somebody had figured that out in the late 50s and I, I started making documentaries uh, in 66. And it's just, that sort of opened up the world. Uh, you can make a movie about anything where there was available light. And I just thought that there was so much going on in common experience that it would be interesting to uh, try and record it. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I made, the first movie I made was about a prison for the criminally insane. And then while I was doing that, I had the idea for an institutional series, which provided a framework uh, the institution provided the framework for the film, and after a prison for the criminally insane, it seems to me the logical thing to do was a high school. And, uh, 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 and then I just been sort of somewhat systematically or in a half-assed way going at it since then. Uh, without, you know, without really, f never feeling that I'd made a choice, it, uh, except I, I, it's very hard to make what are traditionally called fiction films because you need so much money and making documentaries is obviously requires less money and for me it was more fun. I mean it's a sport and you have a good time and you're, you think you learn a lot and you have a lot of strange experiences, you know, what could be better? 
And uh, Clever, this is your first nonfiction film, is that correct? First nonfiction feature? Uh, I actually made my first feature is a is a documentary. It's okay, called what uh, it's called? Critical. Yeah, it's about oh, that's right. film critics and filmmakers. Oh yes, <laughs> the famous film about film critics. That's right. Um, but between these two, I mean, you've made um, several wonderful feature uh, fiction features, um, and you often use the tropes of genre cinema to tell these stories. But they always are about real things. I mean, you really have a kind of gaze on uh, political realities, whether it's colonialism, whether it's the way that cities change, which is a big part of Pictures of Ghosts as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about, for you, the potential, the political potential of fiction, and especially of genre, which is like, you know, this kind of very artificial, very self-evidently, proudly artificial form of fiction? Yeah, there is... Um I find that there is uh, an exciting, for me anyway, uh, chemistry between super realism and, uh, and the fantastique and something that is uh, outside the, the notion of realism. Um, I grew up watching, uh, I, I, I also grew up, I think like everyone in this room, grew up watching uh, American films. Um, and the ones I, I really liked when I was in my early teens, they seem to make they s it's they they seem to have an interesting mix of uh, the fantastic and, and and some kind of realism, uh, something that I don't really see m very often these days with big commercial mm -hmm. films. You see something like an American Werewolf in London, a film by John Landis. Mm -hmm. It's about two guys who go to England, and England is it's very recognizable. Mm -hmm as England in 1981. The houses, the cars, the streets, but it's a werewolf uh, yeah. film. So I think that got me started in a way, just to name one film. But I also should point out that I, I grew up in a, in a country, in a society, uh, Brazil, which was coming out of um, uh, a military dictatorship mm. which began in the 1960s. And uh, I grew up in, a, in, in this country which had uh, one television network which ruled them all. It was mm. uh, all powerful and uh, it defined speech patterns and fashion and, and the way people behaved. And, and of course it had its own very specific uh, political view on the country. It shaped the way people, uh, most people, millions of people behaved. So to do a film or a documentary outside that thinking would be seen as an act of petulance. Mm -hmm. And um, things have changed a little bit, I think. But I, as I grew up, uh, the, the, the power that uh, global television had uh, on everyone, including uh, uh, you know, filmmakers, was, was huge. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think, uh, Coming from the Northeast, which is far from the Southeast, where all the media, powerful media in Brazil is located, uh, it also put me in a, in a situation of, of being a little freer in terms of looking at, uh, at the country. So Brazilian cinema came from ultra-realism, and then the new, a new generation of filmmakers, they, they, ha they are more intimate with uh, notions of genre. So when you mix those two things, uh, you might end up with something that is interesting. You're still being truthful, but in a very kind of crazy, um, be beautifully crazy way, which I think is what happens when you see a great genre film. Um, okay, so then I guess, I, well, there's a lot to talk, there's a lot to unpack in what all three of you said, so I'm kind of thinking through it. Uh, but um, in the meantime, uh, Jason, why don't we, why don't you try to walk us through, let's get back to this idea of trust, and uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about what the consequences of trusting an image are um, for the viewer and for the filmmaker. And yeah, um, that's a really big question. Um, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll try to channel, I'll, I'll try to 
speak through film and photographic references to, to, to present as a cinephile. Um, um, and to speak to the room, I'm sure, I'm, I'm guessing that many of the people in the room, many of you in the room saw the film, um, uh, Alice uh, Diop's film, Saint Omer, in the past year, which, um, you know, it's just a really beautiful film. And, you know, my, one of my, my takeaways from that film is that film really, Lays out the lay, lays out the stakes laid out the stakes for me as I was watching it of what it means to to see like a jury um, to be or to see like a judge and what's lost when we when we sort of inhabit that position of you know did a thing happen or did not a thing happen and sort of as we're watching Saint Omer not to give anything away um, if you haven't seen it still go see it after I say this thing it's like you know the point the the uh, the the, one of the points of this jury trial is not to find out whether or not something happened, but to find out why it happened. Mm -hmm. um, and asking the question, approaching a question of truth is to always shut down the world, you know, the world around it, and to ask them much more, to, to, to foreclose the possibility, I think, of a asking much more useful questions, in part because images, like, you know, I often, like I wouldn't want to be in a in a romantic relationship with somebody who approached things entirely through the lens of truth. Like, are you right? Like, we can ask. Like, should I? You know, what are the terms by which I trust you? How are we related? How do we connect? Um, what is our bond? But to be someone who says like, well, are you truthful or not? How do I know? Right? Always sort of opens up. I mean, uh, uh, it's it's an impossible question fundamentally to. To, to answer, um, um, and so it seems like a really like uh, you know particular kind of if we if we think if we if we transpose that logic onto our intimate intimate lives, then um, it's sort of like the sociopathy of that way of of approaching the world maybe seems you know seems a bit clear, and it's a bit of a rickety analogy because like our our intimate relationships are are personal. I hope, whereas cinema, at least our relationship with with the image on screen is is fundamentally impersonal, however um, attached you know we can feel or however connected we can feel to to the images. And so maybe I'm just like one other I'll say one other thing and 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 then I'll really you know, shut up for a while is I I think you know a photographer that really like got me into this world um, and sort of demonstrated for me a way of thinking is um, the photographer and, and art critic uh, Alan Sakula, who you know some of you may know, or his often often time collaborator and contemporary uh, Martha Rossler. But I think you know often of the um, his uh, and their critique of you know the 1967 MoMA new documents show, which was sort of this announcing to the world the the photographer of Diane Arbus and um, Gary Winogrand and, and Friedlander. And Sakula wrote about the show in the context not of, you know, um, his frustration with the show is not that this work of documentary photography was now going into the museum, that it shouldn't be art, it should be in, a, it should be in whatever social justice organized spaces. It's that to become legible and to, and to start to have financial value in the art world, it had to sort of shed its um, relationships to, um, to the world outside it. We had to learn how to talk about that work in terms of aesthetics um, as opposed to in terms of its connections to movement. And for Sakula, he's like, this is happening at a time when you know, the American landscape is fundamentally transforming. It's moving from an industrial com economy to a post-industrial economy. Photography has so much work to do in, you know, um, in social movements, and yet we see it sort of um, coming into the museum through a different set of set of mm. you know um, set of values. And so, all that to say is to ask the question strictly of images whether they're true or not, whether they're accurate to lived experience, is to miss the broader context and how they circulate and what they want, what the images want from us, or what the context in which we watch those images want from us, which can change from a film festival to a community organization screening to street, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not to put a value judgment on one and the other, but to say that the meanings and what things want from us change where, you know, wherever, wherever they follow us. Mm -hmm. Um, that's such an interesting point, and I, I kind of want to go off of that, maybe to Fred. Um, I guess this, I'm interested in this point that Jason raised about 
uh, what happens when you start looking at images of the world from an aesthetic lens? Um, and so, Fred, when you're making movies, is is like beauty ever, does beauty feel in conflict ever with the reality of what you're capturing? I mean, are you thinking about how to make things look pretty on screen, um, how to make it, you know, appealing to a viewer in aesthetic terms? And does that ever feel like it's contradicting some kind of uh, obligation to capture things in a raw or direct way? You're suggesting things that are raw can't be beautiful? No, but I, I wonder if, if sometimes the, uh, the impulse to make things beautiful can sand away things that are not beautiful but need to be looked at and are part of the world. Well, I, you know, honestly, I... I what's that? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, honestly, I, I, I don't understand the question because if you, you, you know, <clears throat> it seems to me the choices between good and bad photography. Mm. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and if you're interested in photography, you want to make it as aesthetic, at least I do, uh, want it to be as, as aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing as possible. And I have no idea what that means, except that it's a subjective judgment. Um, I want to use the technique to create something that I think is uh, uh, pleasing, uh, and I, you know, I, 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 I've never thought of. I mean, I, I wouldn't know how. Maybe you can give me an example of something that's raw, that's also aesthetically pleasing. That is also I, aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, I mean, be, I mean, I don't know what raw means. If raw means well, tough, maybe we, or maybe hard we say or, good and bad. Uh, then instead. To raw, I mean, raw, in, to me, means something that is not very well shot. <laughs> uh. So it's bad. That would be a bad, a bad, an example of bad filmmaking. Not very well shot, right? Sorry, I, I'm all, <clears throat> I'm a bit deaf. Oh, I'm sorry. Just, uh, uh, Turn me up. Uh, Damage my hearing. <laughs> an orangutan. Uh. Um, no, I mean, in terms, so maybe instead of like pretty and ugly, we think about it in terms of good and bad. So if something is, if it's bad, if it's poorly shot, um, what is good? What is good? What is, what is communi I mean, other than well shot, does it communicate something? Is it more efficient in the way that it communicates an idea or, a, or an understanding of the world, an analysis of the world? And then also like thinking about what Jason was saying about uh, works of art kind of having tendrils that go out into the world in, in different contexts, and then having those tendrils be kind of like foreclosed or drawn back in in other contexts, in like institutional screenings or museums. Um, all, three of your, all three of your films um, kind of are about the way that images interact with the world actively. So I mean, is that a, is that a um, is that a necessary feature of a good a good non -f film? Of course, I mean, you know, you're taking pictures of people. Of course, right. it's going to be interaction with the world. What else would it be? Well, Unless it could be bad. It could be animals. poorly lit and ugly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, and so, like, what what makes it good? Beats me. It's what I like. Yeah, <laughs> that's a fine answer. That's reasonable. Um, I'll accept it. Maybe uh, I, I could take this question to Rosine a little bit because um, this is your kind of first experiment with a fictional framework. So the film looks very different from your previous films, which are often like, which have been shot with this like direct relationship with the subject. Um, and here you have a narrative structure, you know, there's a little bit of, even though you're uh, working with people from your life who are not actors for the most part, um, it, it follows the contours of a fictional narrative. Um, and even the, your compositions are very different from how they are in documentary, right? Like in your documentaries, you make it very clear that you're behind the camera. 
And here, you know, it's everything is shot and blocked kind of in a more traditional way, these wide compositions. Um, can you talk a little bit about why this mode felt essential this time in telling the story of your cousin Pierrette and her life? And like what you think the techniques of fiction added, but also maybe took away? Um. I really, uh, the documentary really helped me to, to, to find the fiction that I wanted to do because the fiction that I learned in, in the school of cinema was uh, a Western uh, fiction and uh, um, it was not my reality and it not, was not also adapt to, to capture my reality. And the, the documentary really helped me to, to find how uh, to, to do the fiction that I wanted to do. And uh, you know in Cameroon, the, the art is really in the life of people. And, uh, and there is already a mise-en-scene, there is already uh, the cinema in the way that people live, in the, in the rituals, in, the, in the, the way of working. And uh, the documentary will help me to see that because I have to deconstruct also uh, all I learned to find uh, the way that I wanted to, to do the fiction. Mm -hmm. And to answer your question, that way of, I, I wanted to film uh, uh, Pierrette in the rhythm of her life. And she really helped me to to find that way. I, I didn't know, knew it before uh, coming. I have an idea, but she really helped me to find the rhythm of her life. And I think that uh, even if uh, the cadrage is really fictional, but the rhythm of the film is not fictional, it's really the rhythm of the way that she really work, lives, and act in, mm -hmm. the, in, in the real life. And I think that using the fiction here was just the way of um, of pointing the what was invisible in her life because what is what is in the film it is the reality but the fiction helped me to go and point the invisibility that I wanted to to show up. Like uh, like what things did you think would would be invisible without the fictional the framework? The political aspect of of the film was mm -hmm. not. It was the consequences of what Pierret experienced in her daily life, but it was not quite visible. Mm -hmm. And the fiction helped me to go and point it to, to show the invisible in, in her reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Clever, for, um, you know, one thing that I found really fascinating about your film um, is how the lines between your real memories and your memories of movies are blurred just because you use so much of your own life and spaces in, in making your films. And you know, there's a remarkable moment where you have a photo and you say there's a ghost in the photo. And you know, it's this, you really are almost mistrusting sometimes your, uh, your own memories because they've become so uh, enmeshed with the ways in which you filmed and the spaces in which you grew up. And can you talk a little bit about what making this film, you know, made you realize about what we invest in movies? Like, what do we invest in in cinematic images, and how how they function as this this kind of uh, form of myth making almost? Yeah, I, one of the uh, interviews I gave during the Brazilian release. The film is out in cinemas now in Brazil, and this. This uh, interview, he managed to get out of me uh, an interesting thought, which is going to the cinema in downtown Recife and leaving the screening mm -hmm. as the door, the side door opens. And once you step outside onto the pavement, the sidewalk, and then you can, s you can still, you can see that it is still uh, sunshine and it's uh, the, the sun is about to go down and you get all the noises from the city and uh, mm -hmm. there's a middle ground in that area mm -hmm. where you're still in the film and, and you're going back to the city, you're going back to mm -hmm. life. 
And, I, and that's one thing that I found when I was looking at the footage shots in, 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 in the place where my family used to live for 40 years. Because it was just a normal apartment, but uh, I, I shot so many little films there mm -hmm. from so many different angles and on VHS and U-Matic and Betacam, Hi8 and Super8 and 35 millimeter that the place, the place was a place of cinema, whatever that means, but it was also the place where I lived my life. It mm. was just a normal kitchen, but it was a kitchen uh, reprocessed by, by different lenses and all kinds of different mm. equipment. So it's almost like you can step inside film and then you can step out of the film and just go back to living your normal life. And I think that's a fascinating uh, um, mm. thought about these things that we do, which are films. Mm. Because films are, at some point they become an entity. When, when somebody is, is talking about your film, you realize that it has gone on to become something else. Mm. It's not only the film that you have made. It may start with your friends, when, when you show a rough cut to your friends, that's when the film begins. Mm -hmm. But then when it's out on release, it becomes a different uh, organism and mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful thing. Stepping in and out is, mm -hmm. is really interesting for a film like this. Yeah, Roland Barth has an essay called Leaving the Movie Theater and he says his favorite part of going to the movies is the moment where you step out. And suddenly, the, now the movie is in your head. It's not what you saw, it's in your head. And it's also on the sidewalk, and it's also on your like trip home. And I really did, I felt like I was vicariously experiencing how movies had, over the years, lived in your head while watching pictures of ghosts. As you know, Even though I've seen your movies, and there's little excerpts from, from them, but how they've like lived and grown and, um, and kind of inhabited the other parts of your life you know, since, since you've made them and shared them with the world. Yeah, I'd just like to go back a little bit to what you said about beautiful or raw images. Mm. I, uh, the, a lot of this film is made up of low-grade, low-quality, low-resolution, badly shot uh, images. And, uh, <laughs> and I really th uh, shot by myself 30 years ago, 33 years ago on VHS. And I really think that Time passed, and time did something to those images, mm. and and hopefully they they mean something new once they are edited together, and 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 they I find them beautiful actually now, mm. even considering that many other shots were shot with the Alexa, f almost 4K and 35 millimeter color, mm. and uh, but there is something beautiful about the way they uh, they tell me about myself. Mm. as a person, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, I, and maybe to rephrase the question I, I was posing to Fred, um, there is a way in which people often associate amateurish style, lo-fi cinematography with the real. I mean, it's a little bit because people shoot on the street with their phone, like with a, you know, handheld camera. And so, I mean, for Fred, in your films, I think... You have, for instance, the film that you have in the festival, um, it's so, your films are always very beautifully shot. I mean, they don't rely on these kind of tricks to get across a sense of reality, you know? There's no kind of this excessive shakiness of the camera or, you know, these other things, like the ways in which reality has become an effect now that filmmakers deploy. Um, and yet you manage to keep us, like, with these people for so long. I mean, this film, we stay in this restaurant and with the people behind the restaurant for four hours, uh, and you contrive the sense of, you know, beautiful rhythm that makes us feel like we're really intimate, like we're really getting to know them. And so what are the techniques for you that you feel bring viewers in and keep them with the image and with the world that you're capturing? Thinking. Say more. <laughs> no, well, well, I mean, 50% of what's involved in these movies has nothing to do with film. Mm. And I think it's true of any movie. 
I mean, when I look at the rushes, for example, I mean, I, mean, I, I have to hope briefly describe the editing process. But, for instance, for Menu Plays a Year, I had 150 hours of rushes. Okay. So I have to decide what I'm going to use. And I have no idea of the point of view or the themes or the structure in advance. Okay. So I have to obviously look at the material. So it takes me about six weeks to look at the 150 hours. Then I set aside about 50% of the material. But when I'm looking at a sequence, I have to delude myself into thinking that I understand what's going on in the sequence. Mm. Because if I don't understand what's going on in the sequence, I can't decide I, I, whether or not I want to use it. One, whether or not I want to use it. Two, how I'm going to reduce it from the length it is in the rushes, which is frequently 10 or 15 times longer than what you see in the final film. And three, where uh, I'm going to place it in the structure of the film. So it, 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 it has to be, uh, uh, it, it's, it, I have to try and think my way through the material, mm. which obviously has nothing to do with filmmaking, but it has to do with an, an effort to analyze the behavior the acts, the gestures, the choice of words, the movements that I see in the sequence. Mm. Um, and uh, now, I, which is not to say I'm right about it, but I have to have a theory. I have to be able to explain to myself in words what's going on in the sequence and why I'm arranging the chosen sequences in the order that I select. Hmm. Um, and uh, that's uh, it's, and, and it, by the by the time the editing is over, even if I thought of a cut in the shower or I dreamt the cut or thought of it walking along the street, I have to be able to rationalize. I, it, you know, editing is really a conversation with yourself. It depends how much you find talking to yourself interesting. Uh, 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 but yeah, I, I feel that I ha at the end, I have to provide myself with a verbal rationale as to why, each, why I've selected each shot, its duration, and why it's placed in the particular section of the film mm. uh, that you see it in. Is there anything, I mean, if you, if even 150 hours of rushes, would only give you a selective tale about this place, right? And then you reduce it to four hours. Are you worried about misrepresenting anyone on, or anything? Or, I mean, for example, there's a, just one example, there's a scene where uh, the, the head chef is kind of explaining to, to a younger chef that he's made a mistake in draining the blood from these brains. Right. Um, and kind of walking, it's, it's a really beautiful kind of sequence actually, because then they consult these books and, and you get to understand all the intricacies of this. But you know, that has a narrative. I mean, there is a kind of a cause and effect and, and, and characters. Are you worried about ever misrepresenting people or reducing them through the act of editing or putting these films together? Well, you know, worrying doesn't do me much good. I just have to do the. Uh, I just have to do the best I can with the material I have, and as long as I feel that I'm not faking it, mm. uh, or it's not phony, I use it. And what what is how how do you know it's not phony? Well, like everything else, it's a subjective judgment. I mean, if I think uh, people are acting, I think it's in my experience, mm. it's very rare that people act for the camera. Mm. I mean, different people have different views about that. And I say that because most people aren't good enough actors to suddenly change their behavior because they're being filmed. And if they do change their behavior, it's very evident. Mm. Uh, and, but being a filmmaker is no different than, uh, you, you have to, being a filmmaker, you have to make the same judgments that 
anybody that deals with a lot of people all the time, a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a salesman, mm. uh, whatever, you have to have a good bullshit meter uh, <laughs> uh, in, in order to survive. Uh, and similarly in making these movies, if I think somebody's putting it on for the camera, I stop. But in my judgment, it's extremely rare. Mm. And when it does happen, it's very evident. New title for this panel, Bullshit Meter. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a technical term that not everybody would understand. Can I jump in and say something and ask something um, of, of the filmmakers? I mean, I'd mentioned, I mentioned a little while ago, John and Comfra and, and one of the, the episodes, and you know, one of the things he's talking about is um, the logic behind the making of uh, Black Audio Film Collectives. Hand, Handsworth songs um, from 1986, 87, which I'm guessing many of you have seen. And if you have or if you haven't, one of the things that Handsworth song features is a lot of archival imagery from the 40s and 50s, capturing what's often referred to as the Windrush generation. Um, um, you know, immigrants um, coming from um, uh, formerly, you know, formerly former British colonies to the UK, named the Windrush Generation after the first boat from Jamaica um, in like, '46, bringing um, um, a wave of people over. And what he talks about is trying to use that footage whenever that footage is marshaled in, at, in at least you know, up until the '80s in British popular consciousness. Um, it's to say that the only thing you, and this is I'm quoting John Nakamfra, the only thing you can say about black people is that they came off these boats. Um, and he says that in that, he talks about in the film Handsworth song, wanting to insist that this footage is important, that this footage is um, evidence of a particular, you know, of a particular people's history, and yet the work of, I mean, the work, the work of the artist, the work of editing is to make, in, in his sort of very memorable phrase, to make that footage speak other versions of personhood, in quotes. So to, to take, to say this footage is sort of saturated by the narratives that surround it, and then to make them do something different, make them work on, on different terms. And I, I, I mentioned that to sort of ask, you know, um, um, I mean, Racine, you know, you're talking about this, this sort of colonially saturated field of vision in which you came into nonfiction and, and fiction. Um, you know, certainly Kleber, you're, you're working, you're switching, uh, you're moving between fiction and nonfiction, between pushing the limits of genre and then working within sort of, you know, lack of a better phrase, personal nonfiction. I'm interested to ask you about this sort of the, the, the stretch, like the flexibility in the ways of working, um, um, you know, where and how you find sort of more constraints, more freedom, more or less agency, um, and maybe what those, you know, what some of those, those stakes are for you in, 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 in your films. Mm. Mm. For me, what is, um, saturated for me is the power in the cinema because I know how that power was used against people like me. And um, when I saw a film, I can be hurt by the use of that power. And, um, and for me, it was really challenging because that power, it is, um, I don't know how to say it in English, ignorant to mm. cinema. Mm. And uh, you cannot do the cinema without ignoring that power. It is exists, the cinema is like that. And uh, for me, coming in Africa and knowing how that power was used, I was really questioning myself, how could I handle it mm. by filming other? How could I find my way without, how can I use that power? And, uh, and and for me, I use that power by what is excited for me in the experience of making a film is to really discover how I will use that power because I have to let go my role of filmmaking and really 
connecting with my reality and find a way of collaborating with people that I feel because I know that it's only them will bring me in the way that I can use that power by sharing them with, uh, with them. And, um, and it's also in, in the, the using how to, to build the tr or trust or to, to, to also construct that, that trust also with people and with, and I, because f I, as African, when I saw a film in Africa, I'm a little bit finding the name of who would who sh do that image, and uh, and because I want to to links to to make a links between the image and the people, the, the person that who film, and uh, for me it's really challenging because but also exciting because. Uh, I, I, I have an idea of film. I, I imagine it, things of how I want to do that, but I also drop it because I know that is a power to imagine it, a reality that you are not used to. Is a power to mm. to already have an idea, but when I'm confronting, I'm in front of that reality. I have to drop to really connecting and catch the the way of of people the way of uh, the way of how people behaving i have to drop my imagination to dropping my imagination is dropping my power dropping my imagination is finding the way of building and constructing that that trust it's mm -hmm. what is really challenging for me when I'm making mm -hmm. a film. It's how can I find um, the way of sharing that power that e exists mm -hmm. in cinema, yeah? For Clubber, just to kind of go off of what Jason and Rosine said, you know, we've been talking about trust, but I also want to talk about distrust and its role in filmmaking. You know, it's, it can be very powerful also for a filmmaker to say to the viewer in a film, don't trust everything you're seeing here, right? That's powerful politically too. Like when we have images of the global south or of black and brown people, one of the ways in which call, like images produced by colonialism have been treated are, they, 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 this is what, these people are. There's nothing outside of what's pre present in these images of Africa. And something that filmmakers like you are often doing are saying, what you're seeing is just a small part of the life of Pierrette in Cameroon. Just because you see this film doesn't mean now you know everything that needs to be known about Cameroon. And Clubber, I found it so lovely in your film, especially at the end. I won't spoil it because some people may not have seen your film, but there is a beautiful ending where you affirm cinema's capacity, like the power of being tricked by cinema, you know, like letting yourself be tricked and willingly knowing that cinema can trick you and like kind of finding enjoyment in that. So can you talk a little bit about why that was important um, in your film and just what is that, the power of distrust for you? Yeah, I, when I make a film, I usually feel very much free to do whatever I want. Uh, well, of course, you have the budget uh, um, constraints. But other than that, I feel very much uh, at ease uh, when I develop a script and set out to make a film. And Hosin was talking about power, and, and it made me think about one aspect of this Pictures of Ghosts film, this film, Pictures of Ghosts, which is the sequence with, where I talk about a, a house, which is the neighbor's house. Mm -hmm. And I spent 40 years of my life looking at that house from, that, from those angles, from, from our windows. I never once in my life went inside that house. Mm -hmm. I was never invited to go inside that house. We never really had a relationship with the neighbors, except I would see them every day, uh, watering the garden and taking care of the swimming pool. And and of course, the many dogs they had, and, and one of them is in the film. Um, 
So at some point I began to ask myself if it would be fair for me to show that house and to discuss mm. what happened to us because of that house. Because that house gave us physical problems. It was part of our Termites lives. Termites or some... Termites and noise from the dog right. and uh, all kind of, uh, you know, trees uh, which mm -hmm. were not um, pruned, is that the, mm -hmm. the word? So many little physical problems of everyday life. Very little small-scale dramas which I think are, uh, may be interesting in literature and in cinema, depending on how you frame it. So I was really thinking about the house and the people in it and whether I should use it in the film. And I decided to use it because, after all, it is part of my life and I think it's fair. And every shot picture, color picture, uh, black and white picture, VHS, 35, every shot made f for, uh, of the house is, comes, fr comes from our windows. We, I, never, I never shot inside the house. Mm. Um, so that becomes a, a decision that, uh, that you make because uh, cinema is quite powerful and, uh, and once you show the film, the house becomes an entity, it becomes something else. But it is still a house mm -hmm. which belongs to a, a family. And, um, and in the end, I'm happy that I use the house mm -hmm. because I think it's fair. It's fair the way I treated them. Mm -hmm. But it could have it gone a way that, it could have been mean-spirited in a way, and I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. But I treated, them, I treated them with respect, and this is something that I, that I, um, that I did think about. Um, now, of course, um, I mean, what, what was the other part of the... Um, just wondering about, y in many times in your film, but especially toward the end, you affirm the power of cinema to trick us. Yeah. And I just found that very interesting, especially at the end of this documentary portrait of what was in your neighborhood and in Recife. Um, so I'm just curious about why you felt it was important to kind of remind us that cinema is an art of fakery and that you can get pleasure while still knowing that it's, yeah, it, I, it, it's tricking you. I think it says a lot about my own relationship to that area of the city, the downtown area, mm. which is, is real, but it's full of poetry and literature and films have been shot there. And and it had all the best uh, cinemas in, in the city, and, and that's how I grew up. Look, and the carnival, of course, is mm -hmm. quite uh, special and magical. And so I think it makes complete sense to end the film like that, although it comes as a big surprise to many people. Many people actually think it's a documentary section of the film. I actually believe it was shot like fiction. It looks like fiction. It sounds like fiction. I mean, there's shot reverse shot in a way that yeah. feels, you know, in that a car makes me too, think right? of fiction, yeah. So you have like a camera outside the window. Yeah, but it's you. very classically shot, yeah. almost like American I think I thought it was, sequence. I thought it was documentary at first, though. I'm, yeah. I'm, maybe I'm just a, <laughs> It means I failed. I'm one of these. Yeah. But no, it, no, <laughs> at first, and then you, then you tricked me. Which that was, was a tricked. good thing. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it's a sequence that I like, and... Uh, and it seems to get a good reaction. So. Mm. But also, you know, I was thinking about how you often use movies to show realities that have not happened but should. Like I'm thinking of Bakura, you know, your like revisionist history or a revisionist future as well. So there's a way in which you're using things that are familiar to viewers to kind of draw them in. And then that mix of reality and genre means that you're, sta you're saying like this is possible. The things we don't think are possible are possible. Yeah, but breaking expectations is something that I, I enjoy as a cinephile. I enjoy when a film or a book gives me what I was not really expecting, mm. when it goes in a, in a different way. And, and a film like Bakura, of course, is a genre exercise. It's, 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 it's a Western and it's also a kind of um, uh, kind of like an action, a strange action uh, film, but it breaks expectations in terms of the roles that people play in the right. film. 
and it seems to use uh, a certain history, uh, Western, uh, Western world, uh, the history of wars and uh, conflicts, mm. and and then uh, it it kind of breaks expectations, and it came very naturally when when we were writing the script, and mm. maybe it's the same logic with uh, pictures of ghosts. Mm. Do we have time? Yeah. Um, I, I had kind of a uh, really straightforward technical question for Fred about um, the editing process. Do you ever cut from different scenes, from diff like across the timeline, kind of take something, a, a cutaway of the brains, for example, and p move it into a different sequence? Or, or do you have, um, are you kind of chronological or only no, cutting within a sync? No, well, I mean, in the, in the menu place here, there are lots of shots of uh, individual pots. Right. Uh, uh, and I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and whatever's in them. But, uh, no, well, for instance, I, I don't intercut uh, brains and kidneys. They don't, they don't look the same. Right. Uh, 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 I think I'm thinking more in terms of like a, the whole sequ like a whole sequence being moved from lunch to dinner or cutting it, you know, that well, sort of thing. Yeah, Is I it mean, all? I, I mean, uh, it, it, was, it was complicated in the editing because the, the, there were a lot of windows in the kitchen. And so, and also it was spring, so the days were long. Uh, so I, I, I was, I had to be careful about the light right. from one shot to another. Uh, and uh, I, I tried to be very conscious of that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so did you arrive except at for individual, I mean, the, you know, nothing takes place in the order in which it was shot except within a sequence. I don't, I don't change the order within a sequence. But the film could begin with a sequence shot on the last day and end with a sequence shot on the first day. Uh -huh. I, I don't feel any obligation to respect uh, time in the sense of the order in which the sequence was shot, although I respect it internally. Uh, uh, but, I mean, the, uh, the overall goal is to create a movie which is is a fiction because mm. the form is completely different than the form in which uh, the material was collected. Uh, and uh, it's not a document where you, you know, sort of keep going from one sequence to another. Uh, uh, there's an attempt to uh, impose uh, a structure which uh, provides uh, helps provide some meaning to the overall experience. And how it just I'm curious how you you build trust with the people you're filming. I mean, is that um, are you able to just go in and start filming, or do there need to be conversations to to make people feel comfortable with the presence of a camera? Well, well it. Well, it depends on the film. Uh, for, for Menu Plaisir, all the staff knew in advance, so, and they gave their permission in advance. <clears throat> so each day we shot in the kitchen, I didn't have to ask them. For the dining room, I, I made a point of getting permission from all the people that came there to eat, because I was sure that they were all rich, or by, you know they could afford a meal there in any case. <laughs> Uh, and they had good lawyers. Uh, uh, um, but also, the Tuagro family knew a lot of the customers because they were repeat customers, and they often asked permission on my behalf and introduced me, but nobody refused. But uh, Mary Pierre, who, uh, who is the wife of Michel Tuagro, mm -hmm. uh, uh, told me that uh, she, she was concerned uh, that uh, somebody might be photographed who didn't want to be photographed or didn't really want to be photographed with the person that they were with. And she said that she could always tell when a man came with his mistress uh, because he, always, he treated her so nicely. 
trust issues. <laughs> and Rosine, I'm curious the, how this question applies to you as well. Um, since you cast so many non-actors and people that you know are just part of your and Pierrette's life, did you have to have, you know, what kind of conversations did you have? Were there people who said, I don't want to be in a movie? Or he, who didn't want to show parts of their lives uh, to a camera? Uh, for for P Pierrette experience, it's my family, and but f I I uh, did a, a film chez Jolie Coiffure where I was were dealing with many people in the head. Uh, I don't know how to say it. Hair salon. Uh, yes, yeah. hair dresser, and uh, there was many people and like uh, Frederick said, it's what Sabine who was asking for the two people if I can film or not. And, but uh, in my experience of filmmaking, I always film people who are not, who, who, are, who not, don't know nothing about uh, cinema and about the power in the cinema mm -hmm. and how that power can be used against them. And, uh, and I used to, to, to also, to in the sense of building the trust, it is important for me to find the way where I'm in the same level with that, those people. In my family, it's mostly easy because they trust me, they know me, and mm -hmm. they can do anything for me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and how can I bring my mother to understand how, what I'm doing in her own language it's also for me a, also a challenge to find mm -hmm. as a filmmaker to find a common language with people that I film and also putting them in the place where they can feel that they are participating on the making mm -hmm. of the film and uh, yes it's it's all always of breaking my position I'm not a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Um, I, we are finding it with m my mother. I'm. I'm her her child mm -hmm. doing something that uh, she loved, and yeah. And I I finding that position with other, for example, uh, my film Delphine Prayers. It was a friend, and uh, she 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 even asked me in the beginning of the film. I don't want you as the filmmaker. I want you to be the friend that you used to be. Mm -hmm. And it makes me remind that, that I have to lose that power of being a filmmaker in front of those people that I film because they are feeling that power mm -hmm. and they cannot be them if they feel that power. Mm -hmm. My mother can, cannot be my mother that I want to film if I'm in the position of filmmaking mm -hmm. and I have always i'm always in that position of deconstructing what is uh, being a filmmaker and to find a position that will relate directly to people that mm -hmm. i film mm -hmm. yeah. and to just kind of close it out clever just going off of these questions also how was it different for you to make a film about yourself and your life and the people in your life i mean you know a lot of people in your life show up in the footage, and what kind of maybe, you know, did it all feel very easy, but or were there s reservations about putting certain part aspects of your life up there? I mean, you talked about this negotiation with the house, but were there other conversations you had to have with the people in your life about the footage? Sometimes I think I'm fighting an uphill battle because I, I don't think the film is, is about myself, but uh, that's... I think a number of people um, see the film as being uh, autobiographical, and, and I see where the question comes it's from. An, it's an entryway. Yeah. You, it's not no, about you, but your life I is understand. an entryway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what, what got me uh, in to make the film was really the, my relationship to these spaces, to mm -hmm. these places. Um, so I really think it's about the, the apartment where we lived and what my mother did to the apartment as life developed and, and the, the city and how the city changes. And, and I happen to be the one 
showing you this. And, mm. and of course, it has a very personal uh, tone, a very personal um, point of view, I think, which is f I'm fine with that. You mm. know, I, I, and, and but in, in, in it, it doesn't really change. Uh, I don't feel it's a film different from Neighboring Sounds or, mm. or Aquarius or my short films or Bacurau. Because these were all very personal films. And I have never uh, made a film for hire. Nothing wrong with that, but I, it, it's just that I, it hasn't happened. Mm. And, uh, and this film is, is personal because a lot of the, the ideas come from observations that I make made about life and mm. how life has evolved, developed. Um, but yes, but to answer your question, um, it is, I think, I find it tougher, I think, to make a film like this mm -hmm. than to make, uh, because when you make fiction, you might use aspects of your life and you can thinly disguise these aspects. So uh, with a film like this, many of the aspects, they are real. And for example, I showed the film to my brother mm -hmm. and uh, he had a, a very shocked reaction. He never <laughs> thought that I, that I was making this film and that I would be so open about our mother. Mm. Uh, we lost our mother very early. She mm. was 54. And, and that was a very beautiful and tough screening to mm. show it to my brother, you know. And then he, it took him a week to process the film. Mm. And then, and then he, he said, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Mm. But it, it's tough, and, and, and you've got to think about the effect that it might have on people you love. Mm. Because uh, um, when Hossein says about uh, taking away the power of, of being a filmmaker, it, it's ironic because I see so many filmmakers who want to exert that power. <laughs> right. um, and, and they want to use that power to get the film made, and they will hurt people. And mm. I've seen that happen. In the and that is something that I bear in mind. Mm. Know, what does that mean to use their power to get a film made? Give uh, an example of that. Well, uh, you, <laughs> you might use uh, your uh, past relationship or relationship friends uh, from the past and you're not friends anymore. And you will use uh, pictures of those people and they are not really... Uh, well, you're not talking about money, you're talking no, about you not use of material. No, use of the, uh, the, the decisions that you're people. able to, to make as a filmmaker and you have to take in, into consideration how other people feel about life. And they're going to be up on the screen and it's a very kind of um, complex uh, situation which has to be negotiated, I think. Not negotiated in monetary terms, but no, emotionally. I, 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 I didn't know whether you were talking about raising money no. or, or uh, that aspect of power. No, I'm, I'm strictly talking about the emotional aspect of making a film and the people you care or you should care. Mm. Well, simply the people that we film and, uh, and the responsibility that is beyond. Because I, I think that there is a, a lack of integrity in the cinema today is that we are not respons responsible of it's like the cinema it is another world and we live as a filmmaker in another world mm -hmm. and it's like what i'm showing is not what i am <laughs> and uh, and for me it's really dangerous because for me cinema is the life and and I want to keep that integrity also of what I'm choosing and how I'm choosing of doing things, of showing things. It's related to what we see. Because it's also related to, to my history with the cinema and how I have to deconstruct the rest of that power in my way of doing cinema also. Uh, and I would like to ask a question for you. <laughs> Is how, after all your experience of doing fiction film, how, do, what do you, why do you choose to put that, um, that phrase of all the fiction films 
a beautiful documentary? That's a very tough question. Uh, <coughs> because I think that I, I have learned a lot in, during my life as a cinephile, uh, uh, watching fiction films. And many of them felt like documentaries. And it, it's mm. great that I'm in New York City now, because uh, in 1987, uh, I saw a taxi driver for the very first time on television. And it really felt like a documentary about New York City. I mean, there was a story of a guy called Travis, and he drives a car, and he goes insane. But it's very much about, I mean, the image, the image in that film, the, the sidewalks, the streets, the, the marquees, and, and yeah, the whole atmosphere that you get from watching that cinema, that film, in, in a, on, a tele on a little television screen, mm. the way I saw it. It really felt like a, like a documentary. And, uh, and I find that fascinating. Um, and hopefully when somebody watches uh, my films sh shot in Hisifi, they will get, I mean, they can forget about the story and the narrative and they can look at the you know, the, the surroundings and, and, and the streets and the way people dress and they say, well, this, is, this looks right, you mm. know, it's probably, it, it probably is like this, you know. Mm. So that's why I think I, I used that, um, that moment in the film. And, and that's my voice. I dubbed, I dubbed the, f the, f the footage from the film which I found. He doesn't say that in the film and I, I, that's my own voice dubbing uh, that sentence. When I when I saw that I stop <laughs> and go and read all um, your biography and and uh, and I was saying that's a really powerful gesture of dropping the power. <laughs> it's a, great to hear that. Yeah. I think we're gonna open it up for audience questions now, unless our panelists had any other comments or questions for questions each other. For each other, yeah. Oh, going to uh, open it up for audience <coughs> questions now, unless you had any other comments or questions for each other. All right. Um, raise your hands and then someone will bring you a mic. So just. Thank you. Um, I have a question for um, Frederick Wiseman. Um, in New York, you once shot the film The Garden. Um, and thinking about trust, I'm wondering how this um, relationship or collaboration with the management of the Madison Square Garden, I th who I think they um, blackmailed you because they didn't like what you edited together, um, that they wanted to sue you and you decided to not. I think it's the only film you uh, never published. Um, you still came back to New York and did other films later on. I'm just like thinking about trust. I'm wondering like if this particular um, collaboration, um, yeah, um, kind of affected your filmmaking or how you approached a space or another institution. Um, uh, he was referring to a film that you made in New York City, The Garden, yeah. that was never released, that, that you made but was never released. Um, I don't know the context of it, so I won't be able to, to, to recreate anything else, but how did that affect your relationship to filmmaking going forward, questions of trust with? I hope it's going to be released in the next year. Oh. Uh, and it had no effect on my relationship to filmmaking. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You didn't bring more lawyers to the next meeting? Uh, <laughs> um, maybe over here? Yeah. Just, can you just wait for the mic, please? Just yeah. Just. Do speak up if you can. Hello. Oh, maybe that was too loud. Um, so, um, swallowing sort of the social, political, cultural context that you find yourself in, mastigating it, and then spitting it back out as a response or an image or a response, right? It, it seems to me to be a very delicate process. And I also suspect, I'm 
I'm 23, so I don't know anything I just suspect. <laughs> but I suspect that um, it's also, you know, in, in that act of mastigating is sort of where the responsibility lies. Um, so my question is, is how intentional and conscious are you during that step? Um, or is, is being too intentional sort of disrupt the creative, spiritual essence of just organically um, sharing your gaze? By masticating, do you mean post-production? Like, literally, like, processing it, right? Like, you see, you meet someone, or you know your cousin your entire life, and suddenly you're deconstructing what you know in order to show it in, in, in some honest way. Does that make sense? I'm sorry if it doesn't, but... It's a question inspired by Fred's film, it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> a very culinary question. Yeah. Uh, I don't really understand all the aspects of the question. Um, but it's, it's my, my questioning and my intention not uh, really uh, disrupted my way of enjoying making them because I'm excited to be surprised. I'm excited to discover and there is a lot of thing in my film Mamba Pirate that I didn't work because I was open to that. Mm. Even if I intentionally think about how I will make things, how I'll, I want to, I don't want to do things also. And uh, it didn't, um, uh, I don't know how to say it um, in English. It, it didn't um, block me to enjoy doing that and to be open to discover what the cinema will give me in that process of making the film, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, over here. Thank you all very much for being here today. Um, this conversation has made me think a lot about uh, these, this um, remark that Pedro Costa made about his practice as a filmmaker where he's very interested in being, in filming somebody, for example, like filmmaking for him is like, delivering a letter to somebody and then he doesn't film the letter he just films the expression he just wants to be in the room with another person to kind of gauge their reaction and how they respond to something that's deeply intimate and um and this is an open question to everyone but specifically i wanted to um direct this question to Rosine to ask you a little bit about your practice as a filmmaker and i know that pedro costa has for example in his filmmaking practice stripped away more and more people on his crew when he's shooting his film. And is that something that you've also done in your practice? And if so, how has minimalism um, aided you in creating your work and in building trust with your subjects? I think uh, the question is about like, do you, what kind of a crew do you work with? Is it a very small crew? And does that influence the trust that you're subjects have when you're filming them? Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, um, with all my documentary film, I work alone. Uh, it was the first time that I work with the crew with Mamba Pierrette, and it was difficult because it was not a big crew, it was three or four, the rest was my family. And uh, because, uh, I want to to reach on expresses on expresses l'inexpressive on expresses part of people because there is a part of on me that I think that the society where I grew up and how I grew up was inexpressive and uh, I find that expression by doing cinema and I want to encounter that honest process part of people mm -hmm. also. And for, for reaching that, I have to be in 
an intimate place with those people. And, uh, and I always have it in mind that it really came to my first experience behind the camera. And uh, I always have that sensation that, that something on this process, on me and the people that I feel would come out. And I, will, I really find that. And I also organize my set to let that things happen. Mm. And with Mamba Pierrette, with my family, I very much uh, finding that an organized thing to have that moment. And uh, for Mamba Pierrette, we were three, the DOP, the sound engineer, and uh, one assistant, but the rest of people was my family. And uh, yeah. Um, Fred, I'm curious what kind of crew you had while shooting your film. Uh, I know you said that you had a cameraman and you did the sound. How many cameras did you have? How many people were in that space while filming? Uh, the, the, the crew uh, was... Fred. <laughs> Thank you. The crew, there were four of us. Four? Yeah. And so what, what roles were they? You did sound and well, then... Uh, camera, sound. I, this is the first film that I, of my films that I didn't do the sound for. Oh, okay. Because I, uh, because I it was sick. Uh, but I, 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 would, I had a uh, viewer, uh, and so it's a cameraman. In the case, case of this film was a cameraman, a sound man, uh, me, and an assistant. Oh. Um, Maybe in the back there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I've rarely used two cameras. Mm. I mean, usually for a sequence that couldn't be covered for one camera, but that's happened only once or twice. Mm. So even in the kitchen sequences, it was all one camera? In the mm. kitchen? Even in the kitchen sequences where there's so much going on, you just had one camera covering? Yeah, one camera, but the thing, I mean, the, the kitchen sequences were a lot like shooting a theater or a ballet because they were very repetitive. Right. Uh, and since I was there for seven weeks, I could shoot them one way and look at the rushes and then, oh, yeah. oh go back the next day and not shoot exactly the same thing, but mm. a similar thing or sometimes the same thing in a different way. Mm. So you kind uh, of got so, multiple I mean, takes. The, ki the kitchen was more like performance in the sense that it was repetitive. Right. Mm. Okay. Um, my questions are actually about, I was thinking about the title of the talk, Trust Issues, and think about uh, uh, the times that we are living now uh, with content generator platforms, social media, and think about the, how that, um, how that world affect the credibility of a document, document, documentary film uh, and I was thinking about Rosine when she said, like, oh, I'm, I, wa I want to create a story that is talking about what I am. And then I think about uh, people on Instagram and other uh, content generated platforms that it's also creating a sort of trying to portray something what they am. But is it really credible? Is it really real what they are trying to create? Um, and I, I was wondering that, like, how maybe I can also address to Kleber, because I'm from Recife as well, so I'm just like, <laughs> I would love to see. And I know you're really active uh, on, on the platforms as well uh, in a political way, and how that affects the reliability and the credibility of a, a real do a documentary when we have so many people now that call themselves uh, documentary because maybe they are because they are documentary what they want to show of their life uh, and but 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 uh, how does that affect uh, the credibility of um, a documentary f made by a, a filmmaker with a tradition in making filmmaking I don't know if that makes sense but <laughs> yeah it feels like quantum physics in a way you know? <laughs> um. 
I don't know. It's so complex and so complicated. Uh, the storm of <laughs> images that we are subjected to every day, and um, but then I I see films like these, and somehow they organize thoughts in my mind, mm. and maybe that's one way of looking at cinema. Um, but if you, um, if you, you, you could try and shield yourself from, for example, last week, I, I, I consider myself very protective of what I see on the internet, and still I saw a car running over four people, I saw a rave being stormed by Hamas. Um, so it's just a lot of uh, information and a lot of violence that you see. <coughs> and uh, fights in bars and things like that. And, and that whole thing gets to you in, in a way. And, and I find it always hard to, to process. Even before you want to understand what exactly is happening, you are seeing uh, uh, acts of violence and uh, so I find it, uh, it, it's a, it, but on the other way, it's, an in, it's a very interesting time to make films, I think. Mm. Um, yeah, mm. put myself in a difficult situation now because I don't know what to say. It's a tough question. I feel like you, I, I don't know what you said is similar to what Fred said earlier when I was asking him about, you know, putting together his movies and he said thinking and maybe and the way you said like these movies help organize your thoughts and in a way a lot of the f footage and media we see are not really conducive to thinking through and I feel like that's what's distinctive about all your films you're using images as a way to think and to make us think in a certain sequence and logic so I don't know yeah that's that's what we try yeah. Yeah, but I, I have to say that I'm I'm happy to be uh, here with these two filmmakers. That's I think that might be a nice note to end on. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you so much, Rosine, Clever, Fred, Jason.